thank God for this wonderful, wonderful promise. Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm a pilgrim to the land of joy and love. Christ guaranteed to receive me to his rest prepared above. This is his promise and his word is verily, verily, I say unto you, the truth, the truth, I tell you. I am rest assured. Brothers and sisters, dear viewers, please be sure of your belonging. Beside the UK, we are going to pray for Georgia, Bangladesh and Chad. The latest have been on the news lately. Last week, the former president, Idris Dibi, was assassinated or killed on the 20th of, uh, announced on the 20th of uh, April. A ruler, a dictator for 30 years, yet he was tolerated by the West because of maintaining stability and uh, instrumental in the fight against Boko Haram and Islamist uh, Muslim militants in the region. Last year, we covered three episodes concerning Turkey, the blood-spattered history, then proceeded to welcome to Yukistan. Coming to the final episode, before a pause to deal with logistic and practical matters, please allow me to say a big thank you for viewers and subscribers to my channels over the past year. Thank you for your encouragement. I heard from some of you on a personal level and that was encouraging to press on. I'm committed to pray, research and uh, hopefully we will have a return soon to this uh, program dealing with persecution around the world. This book of martyrs was a source of inspiration for many. The book conveys real stories of Christian faithfulness, the perseverance of the Christian faith in the United Kingdom in spite of severe persecutions. Many thousands have faced death by hanging, by burning, and in so many ways being tortured because of their Christian faith. They persevered, they developed the country, they pressed on, and the turn for this generation to preserve this heritage. I wonder at times if present-day persecution is taking place at the hand of our Muslim co-citizens and fellow world citizens. I confidently could say that Muslims are not only persecuting the Christians, particularly Christians, but all other non-Muslims. If we do not wake up, we are all falling under the Islamist persecution and here we allow them because of democracy because they are uh, ethnic minorities all these excuses our bible reading in the past five episodes was taken from the book of prophet Hosea, chapter 7 and verses 8 and 9 let's read them again Ephraim has mixed itself like flour among the nations. Ephraim is like a ruined cake of bread that is scorched on one side. Foreigners are consuming what his strenuous labors produced, but he does not recognize it. His head is filled with gray hair, but he does not realize it. The New Living Translations put it uh, that Ephraim is worthless as half-baked bread.
discoursed on one side and like a dough on the other side. Neither good bread nor a dough. And then we have read like Ephraim has a grey hair without recognizing it. We talked quite a bit about it as a process. We all have grey hair, if we have hair at all, and uh, we may do something about it. Some may opt to uh, dye it, some would leave it, some would pluck it, uh, etc. But we know what is happening on our own head. Ephraim's problem was not the grey hair, but the problem he did not realize it. Does this apply on our government today? So I will leave verse 10 to the end and will go with you to verse 11 for this episode. Let us read it. Ephraim has been like a dove, easily deceived and lacking discernment. They called to Egypt for help. They turned to Assyria for protection. Ephraim has become like a silly, senseless dove. They call to Egypt and they go to Assyria. In losing direction, Ephraim went to Egypt, they go to Assyria, they swung between enemies. True to the proverbial Arabic saying, من تحت الدلف لتحت المزراب From under the marsh to under the gutter or from under the dripping to under the drain pipe. Best English equivalent can be out of the frying pan into the fire. That is leaving a bad situation to fall into a worse one. Why people do that? Desperation. Lack of direction. Lack of discernment, miscalculation, no compass. I'm afraid the UK is falling into this trap. Politicians find themselves in a dilemma. How to deal with the Muslim Brotherhood and the like. We are having homegrown terrorists. Worse than that. The UK was exporting terrorists abroad to fight with ISIS and its remnants, with the Boko Haram and other Islamist militant groups around the world. Politicians are perplexed and may stretch the hand to the wrong people in asking for help, like Ephraim. Went to Egypt go to Assyria, both enemies. The reason is in the phrasing we have read together. Ephraim has become like a silly, senseless dove. In Hebrew, Ephraim, Kayona, Pota, Ein Lib. I translate Ephraim is like a crazy dove with no heart or mind, as the word lib may means. If we look at other translations, we benefit from getting a better meaning. Yona pota, crazy dove. Mindless, foolish, senseless, decoyed, easily tricked, easily deceived, and without senses without understanding, not having a heart or heartless, without wisdom, fluttering back and forth. I like this. Fluttering back and forth. Lacking sense, clueless, having no clue. In the British history, King William IV, between the 18th and the 19th century, was known to, to introduce several reforms concerning the poor, 
respecting child labor and abolish slavery in nearly the whole British Empire. As we know, William is nicknamed Bill and Bill will be nicknamed Billy. And uh, King William, when he allegedly, when he used to do things wrong and not in the proper manner, he would call himself Silly Billy. Yet Silly Billy is a character of a clown that uh, made several uh, funny episodes, very entertaining for children, grown up as well. All right, Chad, here we go. My name is Silly Billy. Hi. Yeah, hi. Okay, Chad, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a trick. I wonder how many of our politicians can be called silly. Like senseless doff, losing direction, losing proper judgment. It is not only silly Billy, but could be silly X, Y, Z in our society. Here in the UK, as we have seen from previous episodes, children are receiving extra education from the wrong sources. Uh, I'm just teaching uh, the holy book, the Quran, uh -huh. and some, uh, some hadith the saints of the prophets and, and to young two boys young, young, young kids yeah. 9 10 years old monday to friday every day monday yeah. to friday wow. from what time from 5, five till half seven. Five to half seven. so that's after regular school yeah when young children are spending two to three hours a day on a daily basis for islamic education to indoctrinate them as we have seen and also, I remind us with a documentary of Sayyid al Khomeini when he said, after visiting Amsterdam, ruin your house, Amsterdam. He said, all these centers are producing terrorists. All what we have seen around us, he was saying, this is a Muslim thinker, saying that all what we see around us are centers for producing terrorists. That is potential terrorist. They might be innocent children, wonderful children. They are losing their childhood to be subjugated to this extra teaching on a daily basis. And that's, that's, that's typical of, uh, of, of Muslims in UK that uh, they will go to, 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 to the school in the, in the morning and in the evening they will go to these supplementary schools. That's a heavy schedule. It's a very heavy schedule. So did I. Even Saturdays and Sundays. The problem is in the literature taught here. The rule for the knees. That is for non-Muslims in the house of Islam, those in the West, the Muslims in the West are in the house of war. The literature of Ibn Taymiyyah are studied here. Ibn Taymiyyah revived the Hanbalite movement in Saudi Arabia. The Hanbalite is one of the four uh, Sunni Muslim, that majority Muslim school of fiqh. We have the Maliki, Shafi'i, Hanafi, and Hanbali, Hanbalite. Uh, Ibn Taymiyyah uh, was in prison in the citadel of Damascus, where I was privileged to spend a few nights as well, and he died there. The teaching of Ibn Taymiyyah was followed by Ibn Qayyim al Josiya. That's Ibn al Qayyim. This is volume one. Volume 2, again to do with the Zimmi, the non-Muslims, citizens, second class, third class. This is other, some of 
with other books, the commentary on the Quran and other books, the tales about women and various other books, Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Qayyim al Juziya are prominent in the studies of Islam today, still for the application today. Very sad. Those people, Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Qayyim and Juziya, influenced Hassan al-Banna, the founder of Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. Uh, they influenced Sayyid Qutb, uh, who was hanged in Egypt as well, and Abdullah Yusuf Hazam, a founding member of Al-Qaeda and the grandfather of militant Islam, militant jihad in Islam in the world today. The biggest source of all this is this book, the Nobel Quran, distributed this version in particular, Hilali Khan version. I, I sent a message to our PM concerning that. Some of the things had been done, but not uh, fully. The Hilali Khan promotes racial discrimination, hatred against Christians and Jews. And this version, this Hilali Khan translation of the Nobel Quran is distributed freely. Hundreds of thousands and thousands of copies are distributed freely in different uh, uh, editions in the UK. This is a bilingual one I have. This book must be stopped. This translation in particular must be stopped. I will do another, possibly in the future, special episode concerning the Hilali Khan translations and other translations or mistranslations of the Quran, the enhanced translations of the Quran. I am not standing against the Muslims. I'm standing against the ideology. Muslim women claim Islam has granted us freedom. But they say it here in the West. So they have the freedom here, not in the Muslim world. The majority. I praise God for the de developing regions in the Muslim world where there are some equalities. I wish for Muslim women would stand and say thank you to the host culture. Thank you, Britain. Thank you, France. Thank you, Poland. Thank you, Germany, for the freedom granted to us. Not coming to boast that Islam granted them freedom. Islam has not. Shamaima Begum is one of the hot issues. It's not unique, sadly, but one of the hot issues. Let us watch. I'm not oppressed. If I was oppressed, I wouldn't be a Muslim right now. If I thought Islam was an oppressive religion, I would have left Islam. Islam has made me free. She's a poster girl for the jihad. This young British woman has traded life in London for a supporting role in the war in Syria. She's a fighter by marriage, newly wed to a jihadi from Sweden. Alhamdulillah, I couldn't find anyone in UK that was, you know, willing to just sacrifice their life in this world for the life in the hereafter, for best in the hereafter, in fact. So Alhamdulillah, I pray my Sakhara and Allah ruled that I came here to marry Abu Bakr. I would love people to debate what to do with her and people like her. Those terrorist fighters or spouses of terrorists who return to the West or intend to return to the West and it is a big dilemma. I wonder if we will have a debate, uh, just you can write uh, 
in the comments below and uh, just talk about it. Express your opinion. I would be interested to learn what my viewers would think of the matter. How can we assure around the countries of Europe that everyone will follow the definition of integration laid out by the respective governments? When most governments do not have a clearly constructed framework for implementing their integration policies. Each minority group, in this case Muslims, must be looked at in its own context, thereby ensuring that a way is found to take both the minority and the majority cultures into account. If this is true, can one really define integration as being positive or negative? To me, integration is a positive, always positive. Assimilation is negative. What our American friends would call assimilation, I think uh, they replace the word integration with uh, assimilation. Uh, I, I think, to my understanding, assimilation is negative. I don't have to assimilate the host culture, but I can integrate, I can take and give and be a vital part in the development of myself and the host culture. Integration is both-sided. It is positive. Let's talk more about it later as well. Our families, that's my family, my physical family, have been migrants in the Middle East. Let me talk about Syria, Damascus, and the village in Gota, Noni, where the North African uh, resides. They migrated from Algeria mainly to Syria to some to other uh, countries in the region like Lebanon in particular my uh, grandpa was in the Lebanon and they made valuable contribution to the host culture they did not go there as a beggar for help and welfare my school my elementary school Ibn Khaldun was built by the hands of my families, my ancestors, with their finances, with their money. So they came to the country, they came to the city, to Damascus. They built their own school for the children. It's not only for them. We had more Syrians, I would say, we were Syrians, considered, than uh, North Africans at the school. But the school was built by the North Africa, and the plaque is there outside the school up to today. 20 meters from our home, we had the house of Abdurrahman Khetawi, an Algerian from our big family, who became the defense minister, and many of my family members took prominent positions in the country because of the integrity as migrants. They contributed, they interacted, they integrated and kept their culture as well. So we were bilingual cultures, integrated well. The older generation had difficulty speaking Arabic, the Middle Eastern Arabic, and not even North African Arabic because they were uh, Francophony in particular and their own dialects. Yet they integrated, they adopted the local language, we spoke it, and uh, the culture, the food. Between the two of them, we maintained all. That is integration, that is lacking for the uh, migrants and 
immigrants and refugees today. One of our famous Lebanese singers, Sabah, sang the following. لا تستغر حدا من الناس بالعين الحرش بيولعوا عود الثقاب يا بوي يا بوي يا بوي يا بوي Now as promised let us tackle verse 10 in chapter 7 of the prophecy of Isaiah The arrogance of Israel testifies against him, yet they refuse to return to the Lord their God. In spite of all this, they refuse to seek him. Israel turns to Assyria and Egypt for help. And verse 12, I will throw my bird net over them while they are flying. I will bring them down like birds in the sky. I will discipline them when I hear them flocking together. My beloved brother, friend, and teacher, Dr. Samuel Abdel Shahid, wrote the following. The wrath of God and the light of the Holy Scriptures is not the final word, although his anger is startling and terrifying. If we think of it as a divine dilemma, judgment or mercy, God's mercy prevails. And this is what we read about God's heart towards Ephraim, towards us all. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? All my tender compassions are aroused. This is my God. This is the Lord I worship. The God of tender heart the God of compassion, by deed, not by words. I don't, with every reading of the Bible, start with the name of God as a compassion and merciful, but his mercy and compassion is demonstrated evidently throughout the history. Of My message to the Christians is a message of repentance. The message of going back to the early love, to the first love, where one would love the Lord with all their heart, with their, all their mind, with all their strength, with all their abilities, and love others as themselves. The message from the Old Testament is still relevant today. Let us read in the second book of Chronicles. Uh, chapter 7, verse 14. If my people who belong to me humble themselves, pray, seek to please me, and repudiate their sinful practices, then I will respond from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. And the Lord Jesus Christ came to the world to demonstrate God's love, the divine love. For God so loved the world, the whole world, including Muslims. God loves the sinners, but he hates wrongdoing. As mentioned before, we will conclude in prayer for Georgia, for Bangladesh, and for Chad. Shall we pray? Dear God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you because you are a personal God, you are a loving God, you are a relational God, you want to establish a relationship with us humans, whoever we are. Father, we pray for the situation in Georgia. We thank you for this developing country, but we pray for maintenance of human rights. We pray for the people in Bangladesh, where 
Fundamental human rights are enshrined in the country's constitution. That is wonderful. Yet, Father God, we pay against corruption in the country that is causing poverty. And Lord, we do pray for Chad, that is currently one of the leading partners in a West African coalition in the fight against Boko Haram and other Islamist militants. Father God, after the death or assassination of Idris Deby, the president, I do pray for his son, General Mahmoud Idris Deby, as has been named interim president. The thing that is not pleasant to so many oppositions, which is rightly so, because this is not a democratic appointment. So, Father God, we do commit Chad to you and people there. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, we pray for the church, the people around the world today. In Jesus' precious name.